Hey guys, I'm your host, Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to this week's episode of Koobana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. My latest book, Koobana Volume 12, is now out. Collecting even more of your favourite stories from the show, you can find creepy ghosts, abandoned buildings, haunted shrines, fascinating monsters, and much, much more. You can find that on Amazon right now, and help support the show at the same time. This week, we're looking at some bizarre mysteries that will have you questioning what's going on and the spine-chilling truth behind them. First up, a university student notices something odd outside his part-time job, but soon realises that in doing so, he's now put himself in danger. Find out why in Ignore Them. This happened around the end of November last year. I had a shift scheduled for my part-time job that day, so I went straight there from university. Work proceeded without incident, but then as I glanced outside at some point, I noticed something strange. There was something ashy, almost white, that looked like a person with arms, legs, head, etc., but was otherwise entirely flat. It didn't appear to be wearing clothes, but because of the colour, it didn't appear to be naked either, and this strange creature passed by the front of the store. What the hell is that? I wondered, and there weren't many customers in the store, so I went outside to check. It really was shaped like a person, but it clearly wasn't. When it passed by me, I saw its face, but it was completely blank, with no nose, mouth, eyes, or even hair. But it wasn't like a person wearing a full tight body suit either. I rushed back into the store and grabbed the nearby manager to drag him outside. Hey, check this out, I said, but apparently he couldn't see anything. He just glared at me like, what the hell are you talking about? He wasn't wrong. If something like that really was walking around outside, then everyone would be looking at it and making a fuss, but it seemed I was the only person there who could see it. I asked a few of the other part-timers if they could see anything, but of course, I was the only one. They must have thought I was losing my mind, because the manager approached me again, worried. You said you've been pretty busy with assignments recently, right? Look. I'm not going to fire you, but why don't you take a break for a bit? If I kept going on about it, people would think I'd gone mad. And it wasn't like this thing I could see was hurting anyone, and it didn't seem to be interfering with me personally either. Maybe I really was just seeing things, so for the time being, I decided to ignore it, even if I could see it, and told the manager and others that I was just joking and tried to play it off. For the next few days, I pretended not to see anything, and did my best to ignore it. But then Aiken, a high school student who worked different days to me, came up to me after work. Hey, so apparently you said something about seeing a strange creature. What exactly did it look like? Why is he bringing this back up now? Is this some new form of harassment? I thought with a bitter smile. Ah, I was just joking, don't worry, I said, but his expression remained serious. No, because, like, I didn't say anything because I didn't want people to think I'm crazy, but a few days ago, I saw something that looked kind of strange too, he said. He didn't appear to be lying, so I asked him to tell me more. What he described sounded exactly like what I'd seen, but not only that, the figure he saw didn't seem to be just passing by, but rather, it was actually following someone. On top of that, while I hadn't noticed it, apparently this thing, or things, passed by the store not just once or twice a day, but rather quite frequently, like once or twice every hour. After discussing it, we were both curious about what these things were, so we decided to use our next day off together to follow one of them. We met that morning at a corner near work, 
And then we went straight over and saw one. It seemed to be following a woman in her late twenties, but this time it was a little different to usual. The figures we had seen up until that point were mostly white or ashy and shaped like people, but this one was clearly darker and it was even missing some body parts. Specifically, the shoulder and side area looked like it had been gouged out in a circular shape. Like, if that were human, they would very clearly be dead. What the hell? That's creepy, Akun said. But despite his horror, he started following it. Have you ever seen one like that before? He asked. No, I've only ever seen white ones, I said. Something about this didn't feel right, but I tried to convince myself it was just my imagination and kept following it. After a 10 minute walk, we arrived at a television station building. The woman entered the building with the creature following right behind her, but when Akun and I saw the building, we were speechless. It was surrounded by these figures. Not just 10 or 20 of them, but like three or 400. I'd seen the figures several times in a day, so I knew there wasn't just one, but still, I had no idea there were that many, and Akun seemed to be just as shocked as me. We observed them for a while and came to understand a few things. These human-shaped figures came in quite the range of colours. Some were almost purely white, while others were almost purely black. They also had a wide range of missing body parts. Some were missing almost half their body, like the figure we saw following the woman, while others were missing just an arm, a leg, or even part of their head. Then there were some that were missing the entire upper half of their body, and others, like the ones I'd seen, that were missing nothing at all. There also didn't seem to be any concrete relationship between their colour or missing body parts. They might be white or black, and they might be missing some body parts or nothing at all. And interestingly, there were some that followed people into the building, others simply hung around in the front or in the underground parking lot, and then others followed people as they came out of the building, although not everybody. In principle, one figure followed one person, but they didn't follow every single person who came out of the building. The people they followed also didn't seem to have anything in common. They were all different and no pattern could be found. On that note, if someone got into a car or taxi and a figure was following them, that figure seemed to get sucked into the car with them. And if they were getting out of a car, then it also slipped out with them too. Both Akun and I had visited this building out of curiosity since starting our job, but I'd never seen anything like this before. None of it made any sense. As I stood there thinking, I turned to look at Akun and noticed one of them appeared behind him. Eh? I thought, and I went to say something to him, but the figure spoke first. Hey, you've noticed, right? You can see me, right? The voice was strange, like it was muffled and impossible to tell if it was a man or a woman. As it spoke, it sounded like the noise you might hear from an AM radio station with poor reception. Akun was clearly shaken and about to turn around, so I quickly grabbed his arm and pulled him away. Don't turn around and don't say a word. We'll continue this through texts, I whispered. Even now, I don't know why I responded that way, but at the time, I just had this feeling that we shouldn't talk to them and we should pretend we didn't know they were there. I then sent him a text message. Look, for now, we should pretend not to see them and keep acting that way until they give up. When I saw him finish reading it, I casually blurted, Anyway, let's go get something to eat, yeah? And then we left. We just wanted to get as far away from there as possible, so we chatted about what we wanted to eat, where we should go, etc. But the conversation was unnatural and stilted. 
we continued forcing the conversation, starting and stopping, and in between, the thing following us would interject. Hey, you can see me, right? You've noticed me, right? Don't ignore me. Answer me. I know you can see me. And when we stopped at traffic lights, it would look right at my face. The way it spoke was polite and oddly familiar, but the tone was somewhat malicious. On top of that, the creature had no face, so its expression was unreadable and that alone was terrifying. As we were having this unnatural conversation that was like a game of catch, I remembered a western-style restaurant some distance away that had good reviews. Hey, it's a little far, but I know of this place with great food. You want to go there? I asked Akun. We made our way to the station, got on the train, and 30 minutes later arrived at our destination. As we passed through the ticket gates, Akun sent me a message. Hey, there are more and more of those things, he wrote. When I looked at his face, he was clearly shaken. I only saw one of them when we got on the train, so where on earth did they come from, I thought. As we waited at a traffic light, I turned around as naturally as I could to look behind me and was shocked. There were more than 10 of them. When he said there were more, I was expecting one or two, not ten. I was terrified. Only one of them was talking to us, but I never expected this to happen. As we arrived at the restaurant, I did my best to hide how afraid I was and ordered some curry and rice. To be honest, I was so afraid, anxious and desperately trying not to let the figures know that I could see them, that I didn't even taste the food. A couldn't look to be the same way, and to the casual observer, it probably looked like we weren't enjoying our food. Not to mention, they kept gathering around our table, and that figure kept asking us questions as though it had just suddenly remembered. You've noticed me, right? There was no way I could enjoy my food. After that, the two of us checked out a few clothing stores and then went to the arcade. We did our best to ignore them and act like we were enjoying our day off. Thanks to that, by the evening there were less of them following us, and as we made our ways home, there were only two left. But these two alone wouldn't leave. I had no choice but to send Akun a message. Let's go home for now. They're pretty far back, so it shouldn't be long until they leave as well. We can do this. And then we went our separate ways. As expected, once we parted ways, the two figures behind us also split up, and each followed one of us. When I got back to my apartment, it also followed me inside, as I expected. You've noticed me, right? It kept saying. By this point, I was getting more annoyed than scared, but I was afraid of what might happen if I answered, so... I continued ignoring it. Maybe it would get annoyed soon too and leave. When it was almost time for bed, it did seem to get angrier and its questions more persistent and upset. You've noticed me, right? Answer me! But when I got into bed and turned the lights off, it seemed to finally give up. So you haven't noticed. Jeez, it said and then disappeared from the room. Relieved, I was about to fall asleep when suddenly I got a call from Akun. It seemed the creature had disappeared from his house as well, and he was extremely happy. It's finally gone! How about you? He asked, sounding like he was almost in tears. The relief was so much I could hear it over the phone. I wasn't satisfied that it was over yet though. Akun, calm down. We don't know what's going to happen yet, so we need to be careful, I said. No way! It's all over now, he said. But before it disappeared, it said something strange, like, If you have noticed, then... 
I couldn't make out the last part, but the moment he said it, I heard a gasp on the other end of the phone, and then the line went dead. Seriously? I thought, and I quickly tried to call him back, but no matter how many times I tried, he didn't pick up. I had no idea where he lived, so there wasn't anything else I could do, but it wasn't like I could go to sleep in this state either, nor could I rest not knowing whether those things were really gone or not. So instead, I played games and browsed the internet until morning, and because I still had some time before lectures that day, I went straight to work to ask them for A Kun's address. When I arrived, I told the manager that A Kun was acting somewhat strange the night before, so could they give me his address so I could check up on him? Oh no, apparently he was pinned under a collapsing bookshelf last night, and he's in the hospital now, the manager said. It's not life threatening, but his mother called to say that he won't be in for a while. Instead, he gave me the name of the hospital he was in and his room number. That evening, I rushed over to see him. He had apparently hit his head, but it wasn't that serious, and they only expected him to stay in the hospital for a few more days. After that, he'd be able to leave, so it wasn't that bad. I tried asking him what happened the night before, but according to both Aikun and his mother, the hit caused short-term memory loss, so he couldn't remember a single thing from the day before. But it was clear that it wasn't just yesterday's memories. I asked him about those creatures, and Aikun said he had no idea what I was talking about, even though he had known about them prior to the day before. So, it was more accurate to say that he hadn't lost his memories from the day before, but rather that he had lost all his memories of those creatures. What did they do to him after we talked? But other than that, there was nothing odd or strange about him. He was the same Aikun he always was. Oh yeah, he was able to leave the hospital three days after that, and he quickly returned to work as well. Apparently, there's nothing wrong with him these days either. As for those human-looking figures, I continued to see them for a while after that, but before I knew it, they were gone. I haven't heard any more voices since that night either, so I guess everything's okay now. What still bothers me, however, is why there were so many of them around that television station building. Even now, I still don't understand what they were doing there, or what they wanted. There's no doubt in my mind that they were up to no good, but... I have no way to confirm either way. Next, some part-time employees at a transport agency discover the warehouse they use may be haunted, so of course, they decide to check it out. A decision that may end some of their lives. Find out why in I'll Give It To You. This happened more than 10 years ago, when I was a university student. I worked as a sorter and assistant for a small trucking company near my parents' house. The man in charge of the site was the president's son, who was two years older than me, and I also worked with another guy from the same university as me, Aikun. He was, by his own admission, a bit of a fool, but he was always bright and cheerful, and a great colleague. The company was located alongside a national highway on the outskirts of town, but it also had a warehouse near the shopping district in the next town over. I say warehouse, but really it was just a regular two-story house. The first floor was a wide open space with a dirt floor, and apparently they used to do business there several years earlier, but the owners had to close due to debt, and the transport company then snatched it up. However, they had no immediate use for it, so it kind of just sat there. Anyway, one day the president's son happily showed me some photos. Check this out! I took these at the warehouse, look! The photos were taken inside the dim house, and there appeared to be white orbs of light and white smoke throughout all of them. 
Whoa, are these ghost photos? Amazing, right? That house is haunted. There were no people in the photos, so I was skeptical. It could have just been something on the lens. So I didn't really believe him, but for a while, the son decided to put some things in that house and use it as a warehouse. When the son, Akun, and I were moving stuff onto the truck, the boss, who didn't usually visit the site, called us over. You're heading over to the Nakazaki, or maybe he said Takasaki, I'm not sure. House, right? Don't go up to the second floor. I wondered what on earth he was talking about, but I heard we were just using the first floor as storage anyway, so even the sun brushed him off and we didn't think much of it. The three of us got in the truck and chatted about this and that until we arrived. Then we opened the front shutter. Being closed so much, the air inside was stagnant and musty. Beyond the shutters was an open space about four and a half tatami mats large. Beyond that was the Japanese-style living room and kitchen. Beyond that was the bath and, by the looks of it, toilet. To the left from there was a narrow wooden staircase leading to the second floor. The house was pretty long, so I figured there had to be at least two rooms upstairs as well. After clearing the dirt floor and putting the goods down, the president's son grinned. Hey, want to check out the second floor? I wanted to go home early because I was planning to see a friend that day, but Akun seemed into it. Shall we? I didn't want to, but I sadly agreed. We took our shoes off, and then the sun went, I followed him, and Akun went last. The wooden stairs creaked loudly, and we arrived at a dimly lit hall with three rooms to the right. The doors were all sliding doors. We opened the first door to our right. It was a storage room about three tatami mats large. The next two rooms were about twice that size, but they were empty other than the burnt tatami mat flooring. I'll be honest, I was a little excited because the boss did tell us to stay away, so I was thinking something might happen. But in the end, nothing did. Akun took photos with his phone, but he kept muttering, there's nothing here. Well, it is what it is, the son said. Let's go home. We went down the stairs first, and Akun followed. Once we reached the bottom, I looked back at him. He was acting strange. Normally, he was always grinning or laughing, but now he was just standing there, his expression serious and his teeth bared. Then, like a video played in reverse, he started backing up the stairs just like that. The president's son and I both thought he was joking, but he continued climbing the stairs backwards. He didn't even look behind him. He stared at us the whole time, no expression on his face and his teeth bared. Once he reached the top of the stairs, he continued walking backwards down the hall and then disappeared down the end. Sensing something wasn't right, the son and I ran up the stairs. Akun was sitting on his knees before the sliding door at the end of the hall. His upper body trembled and his eyes were tightly shut, but it was hard to tell whether he was laughing or crying. Hey! Hey! We screamed several times, but there was no response. Then the sliding door in front of him slowly opened. His body moved towards the open door, bit by bit, as he sat. Then, he disappeared into the room and the sliding doors quietly closed. All the blood drained from the son's face and he ran down the hall and flung the door open. I quickly followed. Akun was lying on his face in the middle of the empty room like he was standing to attention. We dragged him out and he muttered something the whole time. It sounded like he was saying, I'll give it to you. 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 We dragged him outside, 
But no matter how many times we called out to him, he didn't snap out of it. The president's son pulled out his phone and called an ambulance. Sorry for the lame ending, but I only know bits and pieces of what happened after that. The president absolutely lost it at his son. I couldn't hear very well through the partitioning at the office, but apparently one of the employees leaked that there was a death in that house due to the debts. Of course, the president knew about this, and apparently he planned to demolish it once they were done with the formalities. Purification? But his son didn't say much more than that. Akun was admitted to the hospital because they thought he had lost his mind. I visited him numerous times, and his mother said that every night he got out of bed and lied down face first on the floor. I asked her if she could show me the photos he took on his phone that day, but she refused, saying she'd already handed the phone over to a temple. After a while, I got busy with university and quit my job, and I stopped visiting Akun as well. The last time I saw him, he'd lost a lot of weight, and he was apparently still getting out of bed every night to lie on the floor. For a while, I was worried that something might happen to me as well, but in the end, nothing ever did. Well, so far anyway. That transport company still exists, and I passed by it recently when I went back to visit my parents, but that warehouse is now gone and they put a parking lot there instead. Something must have pulled Akun in, right? He moved while he was sitting on his knees, bit by bit, kind of like he was pushing forward with his toes. Or did he really move without doing anything at all? If so, that really is terrifying. What would you do if you came home one day and a stranger was standing in the middle of your living room? Call the police, or perhaps pour out all your problems to them? The man in this next story decides to do the latter, but it ends up having some strange consequences. Find out why in Man in the Room. I lived alone when I was in university. I spent every day alone, unable to make friends. One day, when I got home from my part-time job, I found a man in my apartment. He didn't seem human, but he didn't appear to be a ghost either. He welcomed me with a smile, and I ended up spending every night talking to him. I told him that I was always alone at school, that I couldn't make any friends, how sad I was, and he smiled and listened to everything. He was there every single night, so we chatted every single night. One night, he reached out and tried to touch me. Next thing I knew, it was morning. My phone was ringing, but I didn't know the name of the person on the display. Confused, I answered it. What the hell are you doing? Hurry up and get over here. The voice spoke with familiarity to me. With no idea what was going on, I rushed to school. And once I got there, everyone started talking to me. All those people who, up until that point, had ignored me. The whole situation made me feel sick. But then someone calling herself my girlfriend showed up. I carefully asked her what the date was and an entire week had passed. Everyone said I was acting different to usual. Scared, I went back home. That guy was sitting there, smiling again. What on earth did it all mean? I asked him, but he just smiled. At first, it was just a week, but now, it's a whole year. When I wake up in the morning, I now have a wife and a daughter. I also hold an important position at work. I have no idea what I'm doing there. Someone, please help me. The students in this next story decide to go for a drive one day to kill some boredom, and end up near some castle ruins they decide to explore. 
but they may not be alone on this creepy, supposedly empty mountain. Find out why in Utate Numa. This happened about 10 years ago, when I was still a student. At the time, my friend A bought a cheap second-hand car, so we often went out on drives with a group of regular friends, and this is something strange we once experienced. One three-day weekend, we didn't have anything to do and, of course, we didn't have girlfriends, so A, B and I gathered at A's apartment. Even with nothing to do, this wasn't uncommon for us. And then somebody suggested we should go for a drive. So we decided to head out without any particular destination in mind. We got on the highway and just drove straight for about three or four hours, then picked a random road to get off. From there, we continued down a national road towards the mountains. A was tired from driving for so long, however, so we decided to stop for a quick break and change drivers. We quickly found an open area that could fit a few parked cars, and then got out there. It looked like a space for putting winter chains on tyres, maybe. At any rate, we all got out and stretched, and then B said, Hey, apparently there are some castle ruins up there. Let's go check it out. Looking in the direction B was pointing, there was an old wooden sign that had been long abandoned, and on it, it said, Castle Ruins. 30 minute walk. There was also a hand drawn map, but it had been weathered so badly that it had mostly disappeared. It seemed there was also something else on the way, but it had also disappeared and it was impossible to tell what. It was around 3.30 pm, and if the walk was only 30 minutes, that was more than enough time to go and come back before it got dark. And so we decided to check it out. After walking up the narrow mountain path for about 20 minutes, it suddenly split in two. A sign or something would have been nice, but sadly, there was nothing, so we had to rely on instinct, and we chose the left path to continue on. A, who walked ahead of us, then suddenly shouted back, Hey, there's something amazing up here, come check it out! We rushed over and saw a stone staircase. But at the top wasn't some castle ruins. Instead, it appeared to be a long abandoned temple. The main hall was still intact, but the bell tower and other buildings had all collapsed, and it was hard to tell if there was a gate, fence, or even bell there to begin with. Either way, we didn't spot any. Weeds had grown between the stone pavement and the area that should have been gravel was also long overgrown with weeds. Strangely, while it was clear that the temple gate and such had been removed, the rest of the temple had been left behind and was in a decent state of decay. Checking the time, there was still plenty of time before sunset, so we decided to have a quick look around. However, after walking around the area, I didn't see anything of interest, and there was no visible path that led further in either. We probably should have taken that right path, I said to A, but then B, who was looking inside the main hall, suddenly screamed. We turned to look and the door was open. We asked him what happened and he said he tried to open it and it did so easily. Inside there was wooden flooring, but not much else, and at a glance it was pretty clean. We went in and the floor was pretty dusty, so it was clear nobody had been inside for quite some time. As I looked around, I then noticed something on the floor. Approaching it, it was an old, wrinkled and yellowed piece of Japanese paper, with something written in beautiful brushstrokes. Utate Numa. Curious, A and B came over to look at it as well, so I showed them. What the hell is Utate Numa? I asked, but neither of them seemed to know. Numa? There was no swamp or pond or anything near the temple. At any rate, there was nothing else inside the room and 
I had no idea what utatenuma meant, so I put the paper back down and we left the temple grounds to go find the castle ruins instead. We returned down the path, took the right one at the fork, and then soon found ourselves at the top of the mountain. There was an old sign stating we were at the inner circle of the castle ruins, so it seemed we'd found our destination. The summit was fairly open, with a great view of the city below. It was a pretty nice spot. And when we looked down, we could see that abandoned temple from earlier. As we chatted about how large the temple grounds looked from up here, I realised something. There was a large black hole, probably a few metres in length, at the edge of the garden that I didn't see when I was looking around earlier. Wait, was that always there? I asked. A small animal came running out of the bushes and, as soon as it did, the hole seemed to move and the animal disappeared into it. What we'd just seen didn't make any sense. Did that hole just move? What the hell? I was in shock, but it wasn't over yet. The hole then floated in the air at a pretty high distance, and then started moving. It was then that I realised it wasn't a hole. It was some flat, pitch black object that I didn't really understand. That flat object floated quite high, and then started making its way towards the path we had just taken to the top of the mountain. At that moment, perhaps startled by the movement, a large bird flew out of a nearby tree and hit the floating object. Yet the bird didn't fall, nor pass through it. It just disappeared. I had no idea what it was, but either way, it was clearly dangerous and it was coming towards us. That much I could tell. We had to get out of there right away. But then the three of us realised something. That thing was climbing the path we had taken, which meant that if we went back, then we'd run straight into it. We had to get away from there, but I didn't know what to do. Then B pointed to some nearby bushes. We can leave through there! We went over and there was a narrow animal trail leading down that you couldn't notice unless you were right on top of it. But we didn't know where this path went, and it was going in the completely opposite direction from where we'd come from, so even if we did escape, it would take us far from the car. A and B seemed to realise this as well, and as we hesitated, suddenly my ears felt strange. The best way to describe it is like, when you're driving up the mountain and then your ears feel different from the change in air pressure. A and B seemed to feel the same thing, and then I looked back down the mountain. That thing was right there, on the flat area that used to be the castle's outer citadel. There was no time to debate anymore. I told the other two that it was right there, and then ran down the animal trail right away. They quickly followed, and as we ran through all the bushes, I heard A yell from behind me. Crap! It's right behind us! I looked back and that black thing was maybe only 10 metres behind us. The three of us stopped pushing through the grass and bushes and ran down the animal trail as fast as we could. I'm not sure how long we ran for, but eventually we spotted a paved road through the trees. Covered in mud, we frantically tumbled down the mountain and then found ourselves finally at the road. Then, suddenly, there was a metallic ringing in my ears and then a loud sound behind us, like an explosion. Surprised, I turned around. That black thing wasn't there, but instead, there was smoke in the air like something had exploded. We were shocked. After that, we got lost on the mountain road for quite some time. It was pretty dark and there were no houses, and by the time we finally got back to the car, it was fully dark. In the end, we never figured out what that thing was. We didn't dare go back there again after what we experienced because, well, what did we have to gain from it? Finally, 
Pilgrims seemed to keep getting lost in Shikoku, despite signs and locals helping out. But why? Find out in... Sign. I'm from Kyushu, but I went to university in Shikoku. Shikoku is famous for its 88 sacred sites, and while that pilgrimage used to be quite dangerous, now there are signs and paved roads everywhere, and locals often help beginners find their way as well. However, there are sections where, if you take a wrong turn, you can get lost in the mountains, and numerous difficult sections from the Kochi to Ehime area leading west. One of my older friends from university was from Ehime, and his parents' house was near one of the sacred sites. To reach it, you had to go through a winding path and then up a small mountain. The path at the bottom of the mountain split in two, and you had to take the left side to reach the sacred site, but sometimes people took the right by mistake. Of course, there were signs, but for some reason, some people still got lost. On that note, the right path did eventually lead to the top of the mountain after several forks, but of course, most people gave up and returned before they ever got there. So, when my friend was in the sixth grade of elementary school, an elderly man doing the pilgrimage went missing nearby, and the locals set out to find him. As usual, they searched the mountain from top to bottom, thinking he might have taken a wrong turn at that path, but they were unable to find him, and as night fell, they broke up for the night to continue the next day. When they did find him, he was in a clearly unnatural spot far from the path in a bamboo forest. It was midsummer, so he was terribly weak, and if they'd been any slower, then he would have died. He was later interviewed by police at the hospital, and he gave an interesting account of what happened. When I reached the foot of the mountain, there was a sign with an arrow pointing right, so I went right. After a while, the undergrowth got so bad that I couldn't see the path anymore, but I saw someone ahead of me, so I followed him. He was dressed in a t-shirt and shorts, with no hat or anything else on hand, but he proceeded without hesitation, so I thought he must have been a local. After about ten minutes, he left the path and disappeared into the woods. I hurried after him before I could stop myself, but he was gone. Once again I was alone, so I grew scared and turned back. Then I saw the path that I had come from, which was supposed to go back downhill, now went uphill. I panicked, turned around, and saw that went uphill as well. I was so confused that I couldn't move, and then I heard voices. I wasn't sure where they were coming from, but I couldn't see anyone, and they were getting closer. It sounded like people chanting, so I got scared and ran into the woods. Then the voices seemed to be right by my neck, blowing against my hair, so I screamed and ran even further in. Then I got lost. His first mistake was at the sign, but when they questioned him further, he said that it was rusted and hard to read. But that sign had been newly erected just a year prior, and people who passed by that way a few days earlier testified there was nothing wrong with it. Plus, no locals had gone up the mountain that day, and nobody saw the old man either. In the end, it was chalked up to a malicious prank, but numerous people continued to go missing after that, so locals who spot people they think might be beginners now make sure they accompany pilgrims to the sacred sites so they don't get lost. A huge thank you and shout out to this week's Kami Tier members, Christina, Just Son, and S Dash. It's thanks to your support, along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show, so thank you very much. Don't forget to check out Koabana Volume 12, out on Amazon right now. And check out our newly revamped merchandise store at koabana.store. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Koabana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on koabana.net. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin for exclusive bonus stories and extras, 
or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash kowabana japan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks guys, stay safe, and I'll see you again next time for even more Kowabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to kowabana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to kowabana.net now.